Hello everyone, my name is Manasa Narayanan. I'm a journalist covering tech, politics, and the intersection between the two. This is Tech Breakdown, a brand new series by the Real Facebook Oversight Board, bringing to you the latest debates on technology, specifically the social media space. We'll talk everything tech, from the micro to the macro, algorithms, networks, platforms, systems, but also solutions and the philosophies underpinning it all. So stick with me. Today, we start with locating the larger big data and social media debate. And what better place to start than with Cambridge Analytica? If you've not heard of the Cambridge Analytica scandal, we have a very special guest who will tell you all about it in a minute. But the simple story about where we are with data today is this. We have a massive amount of data out there about us being collected, stored, shared, that we don't fully understand nor always consent to. This data has become a form of currency that is being exploited and we have too little control on it as individuals. So to talk more about this business of big data, we have with us David Carroll. David is an Associate Professor of Media Design with the Parsons School of Design at the New School and he's joining us from New York. And David was involved in a grand struggle to gain greater control over personal data. He fought to gain access to his own data that was taken from Facebook by this firm called Cambridge Analytica back in 2018. And he was one among 87 million people whose Facebook data was breached by this particular firm, which was in fact used to manipulate waters in the United States. And well, Facebook did nothing about it. So you might also know David from the Netflix documentary, The Great Hack, in which he was featured. Welcome, David. Thank you so much for joining us and being the first get, sort of first guest on the show. It's my pleasure to be here and to reflect upon the scandal and its legacy with you. I know you've been asked this question probably many times now, uh, but do you still want to start by telling us what Cambridge Analytica is for people who probably still don't know, or because it's been a few years, maybe uh, they haven't read about it too much recently, and also about the discoveries that you made in 2018 that made you file a lawsuit against this company here in the UK. Certainly. Yes, Cambridge Analytica, it was um, a very significant Facebook privacy scandal that emerged out of the election of 2016. Uh, the origin of the company is a, a long and storied one, but the um, simple story is um, Steve Bannon, who is also potentially well known as a um, well now uh, indicted me member of the Trump coterie, um, wanted to start a, a data analytics company to advance um, the political aims of uh, a mo movement that he's involved in, and so uh, funded by a very wealthy. A uh, right-wing donor family uh, purchased a British company called Strategic Communications Laboratories, uh, which had been very active for many years in the area of both military information operations as well as activities in the election space around the world and also commercial work. So a very interesting uh, attempt by um, Republican interests in the U.S. to develop a technology arm uh, for electioneering. Uh, that company uh, then hired a company that was made out of the University of Cambridge, the Psychometrics Lab. Um, so that's part of where it gets its name. And um, some researchers out of that lab created a company. And that little teeny company of two um, were the ones that harvested the Facebook data out of a personality quiz. And that is the subject of the privacy scandal and um, uh, is difficult to talk about and understand because it does lack a central focal point. So indeed, the intersection between this company, Cambridge Analytica, and Facebook uh, becomes a place for people to grasp the abstraction and indeed the number 87 million is most commonly associated with this scandal um the idea is that this was the number of people 
whose privacy was harmed by the scandal. But we see now, five years plus later, that that number was just a number that people grasped onto because they needed some number to make sense of it. But the number was much, much larger in terms of the number of people who were actually affected by the privacy breach. So for example, it's very um, commonly um, assumed that I was one of the 87 million victims. And um, I often need to fact check people on this because one of the discoveries that I made quite early on is that even though I was not one of the 87 million people because I had been quite privacy defensive for many years online and uh, not only deleted uh, a Facebook account, but um, had set my Facebook account to opt out of the default settings that most people leave on. So even though I was not a member of this 87 million, I still was able to proceed with a lawsuit in the United Kingdom because we were able to determine that Cambridge Analytica had a file on me. And indeed, five years later, we can safely assume that every single registered voter in the United States had a file created by uh, the campaign and many super PACs that contained the traces of the unlawful data harvested from Facebook. So I would argue that the number is more than 220 million if we include everyone who was um, profiled just with the US election of 2016. So it took us so long to grasp the scale of this. So another aspect of this scandal is the process of finding justice for a significant privacy scandal that affected multiple elections and referenda around the world. How do we even begin to um, hold companies accountable for what could be described as mass data abuse uh, in relation to campaigns and elections in a direct and harmful way? We know at least two dimensions of harm caused by Cambridge Analytica beyond the privacy breaches that were um, sort of enough to cause such um, accountability actions to be triggered around the world. So beyond the privacy uh, abuse, we also see the micro-targeting of people with deliberate misinformation. So false information, misleading media elements that are precisely targeted to individuals to potentially uh, demobilize their participation in democracy. So to discourage them or to deter them from voting. So a very sort of anti-democratic way of seeing how you do elections mm -hmm. rather than encourage people, you discourage people. So that's an interesting point you bring up because I did recently rewatch your Netflix documentary and it, it does, like you explain, it looks at how voters were targeted during the 2016 elections by the sperm uh, while they worked with the Republican Party. And in the documentary, you start off by asking your students if they had moments where they felt the adverts they were being shown were very accurate, that they thought that the companies are secretly listening to them via their devices. And I saw that and I thought, I have wondered that too so many times. You say that itself points to the level of accuracy of ad targeting. So just, just for people who probably don't understand how that works, could you explain how sort of this online psychological profiling and targeting works? Sure. I think that people like to believe in the conspiracy theory that their phones are listening to their conversations to target them from for ads because that's that's a mental model that we could understand eavesdropping. Um, but unfortunately, the the machine that is targeting us for ads is a different kind of brain, more of an alien brain. 
And it can see patterns that are difficult for humans to see. And we also overlook the things that it can see. So for example, if you're in a place together talking to friends, the ad targeting knows you're all together at that time. And it has been able to create a pattern of you. And so then your interests become overlapping. So merely the kind of profiles that are generated over time, all figuring out your interests for advertising purposes, when that gets combined with you spending time with peers, uh, that increases its accuracy. And then it, then it falls to reason that you would be talking about things and the coincidence of your co-location together is a vector of targeting that's easily exploitable. So we should, instead of thinking that there's a person on the other side of the microphone writing down notes and figuring out what ads to send us, rather think about an alien brain that's able to see patterns in multi-dimensions. And this also helps us think about how new um, technologies like chatbots and synthetic media generators also work. Again, just seeing patterns in language um, and then being able to act and optimize on that. So it's really an evolution of the use of data to uh, increase the capabilities of advertising, but also just media technology in general. It was interesting you said your data was actually not part of the millions of people who were part of the breach. And um, a few years back, Channel 4 did get hold of the Trump campaign data trove, and you finally got to see what Cambridge Analytica had on you. Um, and what surprised you the most about what you sort of found? And also, how did that make you feel? Yes, it was. Uh, the 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 Netflix documentary ends with a bit of a cliffhanger in that uh, I, I I say that I'll never get my data, but then um, after the film is released in the lead up to the 2020 election, the Trump database is leaked to Channel Four, which also is in the film. So a kind of poetic end and an expression of journalism and whistleblowers and leakers as a last resort when. The regulatory regime has run its course. So we finally got the data that we had always been asking for and originally asked for in January 2017. So even before Trump was inaugurated, we knew the contents of the file. We knew what was in there. And this was really just a process of verifying what we knew. And so in the end, I was delivered at my doorstep. Um, the data that I always knew was there. And it was quite simple, in fact. And I, it's mysterious that they worked so hard to refuse to, to disclose it, that it was merely a very enriched voter registration profile enriched by multiple data brokers who sell these, uh, sell these profiles on the open market, unregulated in the United States, as well as a psychometric score predicting my personality. And that score is derived from the unlawful Facebook harvesting. So even though I was not one of the 87 million, even though I locked down my Facebook maximum settings, I still had a psychological profile created on me. And so did every other registered voter in the United States. Hmm. I guess, I guess then the point to drive at is that this, story of the Cambridge Analytica Facebook scandal and a lot of discoveries we've made um, since tell us that you and me and people out there have become a commodity, right? The digital traces we leave behind all the time now have made us into sort of products, you know, made up of data points. We've become rows and columns on a spreadsheet. And I guess these rows and columns are becoming more elaborate being used to make predictions about how uh, sort of we behave and our choices. What's the most worrying aspect about this for you? Indeed, this was um, a key revelation for many people in approaching the scandal to consider just how 
much voters are packaged up for campaigns no differently than customers are sourced to find people who want to purchase skin creams or go on ski vacations. The exact same mechanics are used for elections. And then on the other side of the coin, uh, techniques used in military operations in the sort of post 9-11 winning hearts and minds, use of information warfare, psychological operations, those expertises have also been transferred into the commercial and election space by companies like SCL, Cambridge Analytica. So the intersection of all of these techniques, mixing them together, uh, creates a inherently dangerous mindset um, that is sort of entirely unethical. So um, this was an aspect to um, uh, kind of accelerate the problems of a democracy for sale uh, and then we look at, in hindsight, with the regulatory and litigation actions in the aftermath, that even justice is for sale in a way, because the FTC, the Federal Trade Commission, issued its largest fine ever to a company. Facebook uh, received a $5 billion fine for the Cambridge Analytica privacy uh, violations. And shareholders argued in a separate lawsuit that this could have been the payoff to avoid a deposition by the executives, Mark Zuckerberg and Sheryl Sandberg. And so, and indeed there were um, commissioners of the FTC that um, did not vote for it and issued their own um, dissent uh, that the settlement without a deposition was insufficient. So we look at that and then we look at the now people who were part of the 87 million are able to request their legal settlement from the class action uh, lawsuit that was consolidated in the Northern District of California and it will be a pittance. Um, and again, uh, the price of doing business um, that the accountability that we wanted in the origins of the scandal were really not achieved in the end, that even accountability might be for sale. And we have to address that problem, especially as more regulation is conceived simply based on the same model of fine and settle. Is justice for sale just like democracy? This would be concerning and indeed a further data-driven model only further enables sort of the potential abuse of the information. Oh, I guess it, it has become a trend and it, it is quite sad that uh, there is now no sort of system of accountability, but in sort of more recent Cambridge Analytica news, it was, revealed that this private Israeli hacking firm run by this person called Tal Hanan was working alongside Cambridge Analytica in a few election meddling operations. And this is a firm that would essentially sow disinformation, false information online and manipulate elections globally. And they themselves have claimed to have manipulated 30 elections around the world. And this is what journalists have been terming now, the disinformation for higher system. So in the context of what you've just said also about Facebook escaping accountability, we can see that it's not just the Facebook Cambridge Analytica um, sort of collision, I guess, but also all these other firms and um, uh, that exist in this space that continue to do so, this sort of, um, I guess, uh, business with big data. So what does this tell us about larger technological space we operate in today? Yes, again, uh, reiterating this problem that there is no firewall between the military industrial complex and the commercial advertising world and social media and electioneering, uh, that we get situations where you have former military guys selling their wares um, 
for undemocratic ends or for campaign uses. And so, uh, yes, it's not surprising that um, the identities of those we suspected of, um, you know, we we're weaponizing cyber operations in conjunction with these campaign tactics, uh, the kind of concept of you hack your opponent and then you leak their private information into the information space to cause chaos and damage, uh, we see is a tried and true playbook used in elections and also used in the 2016 election in the US. And we should expect it to continue to happen uh, as um, the lack of privacy is a problem, not just in the world of social media, but just in the world more uh, broadly when hacking tools are also for sale. I'm, I'm curious to know if you see this as a lot sort of a large big data problem or do you see this as a bad actor problem like is it is it that these technologies exist and are powerful and could be used well when getting in the bad hands or do you sort of I guess think it's also in the nature of big data and how um, it's set up in the commercial space uh, that this is bound to happen uh, yeah, I would say it's it's a it's a combination of the built-in incentives that then a bad actor uh, can readily exploit, and then the challenges of a regulatory regime um, deterring future abuse. So there's a disproportional relationship between how easy it is to cause problems with this technology and how hard it is to then exert um, a protective force. Um, so we were lucky in a way that Steve Bannon decided to export our data to the United Kingdom for whatever strange reason he needed to, because as a result, we gained data rights, data protection rights, that we wouldn't have had otherwise if it had stayed in the United States. And so this is a weird quirk of the scandal. And I sometimes think this hasn't even sunk in for people that to this day, the United States has not granted itself equal data rights to our friends across the Atlantic who enjoy the benefits of fundamental data rights and their democracies enjoy some level of protections accordingly that places like the US does not. I guess you've sort of gotten into um, uh, the space I want to know in terms of thinking solutions. And I guess that's my final question, where now? Um, it's been five years more than that since your lawsuit against Cambridge Analytica. But Meta and Facebook, the company that in fact kind of gave away your data, which has gone through innumerable controversies, has been sued around the world for various issues, continues to make massive profits. And I guess it's still putting, putting people at risk. And I guess it's just not Facebook. There are a lot of other social media companies that are also compromising people's privacy and safety. So what needs to happen now? Well, I think um, in places uh, where there are strong data protection rights in place, those laws sh should be vigorously enforced and the structures of accountability should be exercised. The muscles need to be flexed. Uh, and I think there are many Europeans who do not exercise their rights enough if I had the rights that Europeans had, I would be flexing the muscle a lot more. So I think there's a kind of complacency among those who have the rights that should strengthen their use of them. That could be a big de demonstration of distributed power that goes untapped. Uh, and then in the United States, um, the fight for enumerated privacy rights is probably an epic battle that goes down to a constitutional amendment to deal with the problem of 
a very conservative Supreme Court, for example, or when, um, you know, a kind of the democracy itself gets hacked, as the Republican Party is very good at doing here. So um, these are sort of deep and perennial issues. But I think it helps me to remember that at the fundamental core, you know, the U.S. Constitution was written on parchment paper with a feather under candlelight and the uh, European charter was written on a computer in the 20th century. And that needs to be remembered as a the basis for why our fundamental rights are not in the place they need to be to survive the rapid developments of the 21st century. Um, that, that as we're trying to solve the problem of Cambridge Analytica, we have new advancements in artificial intelligence and la large language learning models that are presenting a whole new array of problems that we need to be looking forward toward and connecting how basic fundamental rights are applicable here too in these new problems. Hmm. I guess I think we should end on that note. I'm not sure. I guess it's looking forward still. And uh, I guess it's to say that the Cambridge Analytica scandal, we probably are still going to find out a little more about it as we go and the legacy will stay and that we have a lot more to do in terms of uh, protecting people and thinking about data uh, also ethically. Um, so thanks so much for joining me today, David. It's been my absolute pleasure to have this conversation. And for those uh, who are sort of new to the concept of big data and targeting, you broke it down for them so well. Thank you so much. Pleasure is all mine. Thanks for having me today. Yeah.